Hello, everyone. Welcome to Governance Call 22. Today on the agenda, we are going to start with a brief governance update. And then we're going to talk a little bit about a migration to open golf. And then there is a topic about unclaimed tin leg rewards as well. So that's the topics we are planning to go through. And then if there is more time left and there are the topics, we can also put them in as well. So let's start with the quick governance update since uh, our last call. We have two proposals that have passed in the DAO. It is CP74, which is for updating the transaction fees for centrifuge pools, which means we have defined the cost of specific transactions on centrifuge related to pools and hence an extension of the token utility. Then there was CP76 that also passed, which was to extend the parachain lease. So we are now extended until Q325, I believe. So uh, yeah, that's uh, the proposals that have ended. There are no ongoing proposals right now, but we do have a two discussions live, which is the discussion for the migration to open golf which is on the agenda, and also a discussion for unclaimed tin leg awards also on the agenda today. So we're going to cover both of them in this call. So let's uh, let's jump into the presentation of, my, uh, of uh, a migration to OpenGov. I've kept the presentation very high level and as non-technical uh, as possible to give like everyone an idea of what it is. Don't worry, we will make it technical at a later stage to discuss all the important things. But for now, it's just a matter of understanding what OpenGov is and what it really means for us. So let me share my screen here and... You all see my screen now. All right. I heard no objections, so I take that as a yes. So migration to OpenGov. So what is OpenGov? Well, it's an unchained voting system, and it's been live on Kusama for a year now and on Polkadot for a few months, and some parachains have already migrated to it. Now, it's more decentralized and it's more flexible than what we are using now, which is Gov1. That's what's currently used on Centrifuge. And I'll come back to what it means that it's more decentralized and flexible. So let's compare Gov1 with OpenGov. To understand, Oh, sorry. To understand, like, to be able to compare them, we need to understand, like, how it works right now on OpenGov when proposals are made on chain. And roughly right now on Gov1, there are two ways to submit proposals on chain. One way is for when the token holders, they submit a proposal, then it becomes what's called a democracy proposal. And then it's, this is basically a queue where it stays for a little time. And there can be more than one proposal in that queue. And the one that has the most endorsement becomes a referendum that all token holders vote on. And then if it passes after a certain time, this proposal gets enacted. A token holder can also make a treasury proposal, which is only voted on by the council. So right now it's the council controlling the treasury. So keep in mind, I've oversimplified this just to give an idea of how it is. There are other elements to this, but this is enough to give you the idea of how it works. So this is one way to submit a proposal when token holders do it. The other way is when the council submits a proposal. And when the council submits a proposal, it works the way that a councillor submits what's called a council motion that is voted on internally in the council. And if there is enough support for it in the council, it becomes a referendum that again, all token holders vote on. 
And again, if it passes, then it gets enacted after some time. Now, there is a difference between the referendum created from a democracy proposal and the referendum created from a council motion, the way that it's actually easier for a referendum to pass when it comes from the council than from the token holder. So there are different requirements, different thresholds for the referendum passing. So this is roughly how it works now. So what is OpenGov? Well, at first glance, it looks a lot more simple because on OpenGov, the token holders are the ones submitting the referenda. So anyone can submit a referendum and then all token holders vote on that referendum. And if it passes, then it gets enacted. Obviously there's a lot more to it in this process here, especially in the referendum stage, but that's not something we're gonna go into right now, but that's some of the things we're actually working on right now to specify this referendum stage. But this is just to show you that it's a much more simple process in a way, and we eliminate the council that is, this is, that is considered a somewhat centralized entity right now. They have a certain power over the network. That's gonna disappear in OpenGov. Power to the token holders. That's how it's gonna work. So some of the main differences between Gov1 and OpenGov, I've selected a few of them, there are more, but these are the ones I thought would be relevant to highlight. And that is one that I, the one that I already talked about, like treasury proposals on Gov1 are only voted on by the council. In OpenGov, everyone decides this, everyone votes on the treasury proposals. Another thing is delegation. So when you delegate your tokens to someone to vote on your behalf, in Gov1 right now, then when you delegate your tokens, the delegate, the person you give your tokens to, or not give your tokens, you delegate your tokens to, can vote on all referenda. On OpenGov, you can actually set your delegation so people can only vote on specific tracks. And I'm not going to go deeper into what tracks is now. For now, look at it as different proposal types. So for example, you can delegate your tokens for someone to vote on only runtime upgrades. You can delegate your tokens for someone to only vote on treasury proposal. So you can specify, but you can also just do like in Gov1, let them vote on everything. And another difference is when it comes to referenda, that right now in Gov1, you can only vote on one referendum at a time, roughly. There are exceptions, but roughly only one referendum at a time. Whereas in OpenGov, you can theoretically have as many referenda that you want to be voted on simultaneously. And also in relation to referenda, in Gov1, there is no turnout required for a referendum to pass. So there is not a requirement for a certain amount of tokens to be used in the voting in order for it to pass. So if somebody, if we have a referendum right now and one person votes yes with one CFG token, it will pass. So there is no requirement. That's different in OpenGov because in OpenGov, there is a requirement for both the turnout, which is called support, and approval. So a certain percentage of the votes have to be yes in order for it to pass. So they, they are like the main differences when we put them up against each other. So why, why would we want to migrate to OpenGov? Well, it's a more decentralized voting mechanism because firstly, we remove the council, which is a somewhat centralized entity. So by definition, if you remove something centralized, it becomes more decentralized. And also everyone will be voting on everything. We also bring more efficiency because you can vote on more than one referendum at a time, like I also mentioned before. It's more flexible with the delegation. Also, like I mentioned before, that you can delegate to different types of proposals. And we also have the flexibility and the ability to customize the life cycle of referenda, meaning we can customize 
and set the criteria for a referendum to pass and the maximum duration of it. So all of these sounds like, like advantages when you see them at the fir at first glance, but if you don't think, or if we don't think properly about how we set up our open gov, these advantages can quickly turn into disadvantages. So it's really a matter of how we set up all of these different parameters for our open gov. So as for those who are voting now in governance, what's changing for you? Glad you're asking, because there's an easy answer to that. Not really much. The only thing that you might see is that there will be more, there can be more referenda to vote on at the same time, whereas you probably used to only voting on one at a time now. And then you will have the ability to vote on treasury proposals. So that's roughly what's going to change for you as a voter. So if you are not one that submits proposals in the first place, then there's not really much that's changing for you. So what's going to stay the same after a migration? Well, you will be using the same user interfaces that you are using now to vote in governance. So Subsquare, Nova Wallet, Polkadot.js apps, whatever you're using, you'll be using the same interfaces to vote in OpenGov as well. And the goal is also to keep our governance process as it is. So we're still gonna keep our request for comments as the initial stage of a proposal to invite for input from the DAO and the token holders on a proposal and also our off-chain voting on open square snapshots. So there's currently no plan of changing those, but keeping them as part of our off-chain governance. So a migration to OpenGov would only affect our on-chain governance. So some timelines for, uh, for the work on OpenGov. Well, right now we are working on the set up some suggestions to the setup of an open gov uh, migration and it will be posted on the forum ideally by the end of this month for the DAO to comment on to provide input on and that can be adjusted based on the input received and then by the end of the year there will the plan is to have a formal proposal with an as an rfc starting there and then Hopefully, or hopefully, or maybe <laughs> at the end of Q1 2024, depending on whether we run into technical obstacles or anything, then we could have a migration. So hopefully this gave you a good idea of what it means, what OpenGov is and what it means uh, to migrate to OpenGov from the mechanism we have now, Gov1. So I'm going to stop this one here. I'm going to have this last one as well. And I'll pause for some questions. So does anyone have any concerns or any questions to, uh, to a migration to OpenGov? Those of you who have experience with it. I'll just jump in and ask, because I kind of put this in the chat, Orhan, um, do you guys already know what sort of tracks you're going to use? Because the one thing that's nice about OpenGov, it's highly customizable, so you don't have to use all the tracks as they currently exist, for instance, on the Polkadot Relay chain. Has there been any thought or conversation around which tracks are going to be used versus which are not? Like, maybe there's no such thing as tipping, for instance, in, in the centrifuge chain. Um, any thought or discussion around that? Well, none of that has been published uh, yet. That's exactly what we are working on right now. I mean, in the end, all of these uh, tracks and their parameters are going to be decided by the token holders. But yes, we have like some ideas of which tracks would be relevant for us to have, at least to begin with. It's possible to change that later on. But we've been trying to look at all the previous proposals that have been made on centrifuge chain so far, just to see like what is it that we need and try to find like some decent parameters um, to those tracks as well. But yeah, that's uh, that's exactly what's gonna be posted on the, on the forum by the end of this month, hopefully. So yes, that's work in progress. Uh, Limo, go ahead. Hey everybody. Yeah, uh, we spoke about this just before the call, uh, Ohan. So 
it's important that um, the parameters for each of these tracks is not too strict. Obviously, if you wanted the safest possible form of governance, you could make it so that 100% of tokens have to vote and it has to be 100% I for stuff to pass, right? But then nothing actually gets done because 100% of tokens are never going to vote, right? Um, there's other chains in Polkadot that have uh, OpenGov enabled um, and they've run into some issues with the support requirements. So the support requirement is the amount of tokens that have shown up to vote, right? And you can set this to be like 0% or 1%, 5%, 10%, whatever, right? Um, so it's important that that criteria is realistic. Um, there's what I won't say the chain, but there's one chain where um, they have difficulties reaching the support requirements, the vote of turnout requirement uh, for like root referendums to pass, for example. So it's important that the support requirement is realistic based on like how what the voter turnout is uh, on the centrifuge chain and all of this can be changed at any time for a runtime upgrade as well if it's too uh too small or too high that's actually very valuable input uh, right there because yeah on one hand we would like our tracks and the parameters to be as safe and secure as possible to avoid spamming up the network and like malicious proposals to pass. But on the other hand, we don't want proposals to fail because there's not enough people voting on it. So it's a very, uh, it's about finding that balance. And I think no matter how we define them to begin with, we're probably gonna run into some obstacles one way or the other. That's why it would be really great yeah, to hear what you're saying right now. And preferably also from some of the other parachains that have already migrated to hear their experience and their lessons learned so far. Um, yeah, thanks, Limo. Jeff, you have your hands up as well. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, and so um, I'm curious, like, uh, after you merged into the open gov and uh, uh, are we still using the safety to vote? Uh, and another thing is uh, uh, the snapshot voting, are we going to keep that feature? I, somehow I feel it's, it's good, it's quite useful, um, but I don't see that in the open gov, so I'm I, I'm not sure whether we can set it up or something like that. What's your thoughts? Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, well, firstly, we it has to go through a vote, so nothing is written in stone, so we haven't migrated yet. But yes, you will still be using CFG to vote. As I said, nothing is going to change in terms of like how or where you vote. So as a token, as a someone who votes on proposals, you're not going to experience like that big of a change after a possible migration. It's mainly for those submitting proposals that are going to experience a slightly different approach to doing it. And yes, as I mentioned um, during the slides, we're going to keep our open square snapshots, our off-chain governance, that is. There's no plan of changing that. So basically only how proposals are submitted on chain and their life cycle. That's roughly what's going to change with a migration to OpenGov. So yeah, did that clarify it, uh, Jeff? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ohan. Cool. All right. Um, anyone else want to tune in with either some experiences from, from other chains or some questions they have related to a migration? I mean, we'll probably try to avoid making it too technical at this stage because there are going to be, I'll promise, there will be enough time for that as well once we have the suggested the parameters and everything so people can tune in as well. So, yeah. Hi guys, Sebi here. Hi, um, Yeah, um, I, I'm not like ex <laughs> master of the, of the government of the open gov anyway. But um, I would like to ask uh, if uh, the council could play any role in this. Basically, I, I'm I'm not. I, I know that uh, the migration will happen. I guess. Um, I just I'm not uh, a fan of it. I kind of uh, have the opinion to stay with the more centralized um, opinion, but uh, I would like to know if the council could play a role anywhere, if it's possible or something. Really good and relevant uh, question. I mean, um, I know there are some projects that have kept their council still, so they are still managing the treasury, for example. They don't have treasury tracks. They are, it's the council just like it is now. So they're basically migrating to OpenGov, but keeping the treasury 
Gov One set up, so they are uh, in charge of the Treasury still. Uh -huh. I, mean, I guess we have the option to, uh, for example, keep both in a transition phase. For example, like uh, so, we could have both Gov One and Open Gov to begin with. I think that is an option. But I mean, the whole idea of, in my opinion, with a migration is to make it more decentralized and the council would need to be removed in order to achieve that part. But I hear what you're saying and so- Yeah, I mean, you know, the, with the whole drama of in Totsama with the open gov, I mean, I'm kind of afraid of the of the treasury. I mean, I love the, the cast, the, I think the, the proposal was the the rules of the of the treasury, which uh, are pretty strict, and uh, I love it. Uh, I'm you know I'm afraid of the grifting all the, uh, and all the stuff happening uh, elsewhere. So, I mean, treasury is something that uh, should be kept like a real treasure. So, uh, it's pretty important for the value of the network. I mean. That's a very good point you're making, yeah. And that is actually the when we suggest the parameters for the treasury track, for example, we have to keep like this in mind to see if we can mitigate like all of these spam proposals, people coming to yeah. just wanting to drain the proposal. But I mean, everyone can submit a proposal to the treasury. And but we did make an agreement in the DAO that passed a few months back, like to be conservative with the spending, but yeah. That doesn't prevent anyone from submitting the proposal, obviously. So we have yeah. to come up, and that's uh, actually I would uh, highly uh, encourage you to um, come and join the discussion post once these uh, parameters are posted and come with all of these inputs because this is really valuable for us to get as much input on uh, this as possible. Because, yes, we are all or most of us are aware of the treasury challenges, let's call them that, on Polkadot, and we would obviously like to learn from that and avoid it if possible. So very good point there, Seppi. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, the guys from from Chaos DAO with um, the group can do an excellent work, but obviously always, you know, there are, you know, centrifuge whales where you can do whatever they want. So it's pretty important to, you know, have some kind of backup <laughs> plan or something. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Let's uh, continue all of this once uh, the specific tracks and the parameters are suggested and then let everyone come with their input and let's get to an agreement that way. But I um, appreciate you tuning in, Sebi, as always. Okay, if there's not anything else, um, then I will suggest to move on to the next topic on the agenda. Oh, David, go ahead, you have a question. Yeah, I guess my question is um, regarding like treasury. Can't we set up a track for specific like treasury related votes and then basically recreate like a council like structure through the delegates? Like delegates can basically choose who the council is um, through that delegate permission, right? That is uh, indeed an option, and that is what I believe Moonbeam are doing. They have a council committee, which is practically uh, the council as it is now, and they don't have any treasury tracks. So you cannot submit them using OpenGov tracks, but you would do them like you do in OpenGov, and then it's voted on as they are on Open on the Gov1, sorry. So it is possible that option, but again, then are we really decentralizing the on-chain governance if we keep it that way? So obviously the treasury is a very sensible topic and it's one we definitely need to have and discuss more in depth. So um, keep all of these options and ideas in mind and let's put our brains together and come up with a good solution and see how it turns out like on the other parachains meanwhile as well. Right, uh, Limo, go ahead. Just a, a quick one, I'll try and not make it too technical. So a lot of the issue on like Polkadot, for example, is there's like one wheel account voting, right? Um, but everybody is uh, stressed out about like 1% of the tokens voting in total, right? So it's very low um, support levels. Um, so so whales are obviously impacting the vote, right? Whereas the way to solve it is if, if everybody in the community is voting or delegating to somebody else, 
uh, the power of wills can be diluted significantly. Um, and I'm not sure if the best way to handle it is to initially try and stop one whale that people might think is like acting not in the best interests. But whale accounts typically would want to act in the best interest because they have the most to lose, right? Um, you might disagree of how they're voting, but if the community is solid, you can reason with people. Um, so I don't think it's the biggest issue. And yeah, just more participation dilutes the voting power of whales. That's a fair point. Good point as well. All right. Thank you for uh, everyone for tuning in in this um, discussion. That was really great. I'm looking forward to continue it once um, we have the suggestions for the tracks and parameters. So let's move on to the next point on the agenda, which is about the unclaimed tin leg rewards. So um, if you're ready, Ivan, I'm going to pass it on to you so you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so sorry for a short notice and I just posted this topic this morning. The governance and coordination group would like to get his opinion of centrifuge DAO and centrifuge token holders and it is a discussion regarding the transfer of unclaimed tin lake rewards to centrifuge DAO. Just a quick note that this is not an official governance proposal but just a discussion. So maybe I will introduce a little bit of background. So with CP61 pool rewards parameters were adjusted and this proposal passed and was approved. And we agreed that after three months, the rewards on Tin Lake will be winded down. And uh, last week, the rewards parameter were set to zero for drop and tin tokens. So now we have around 5.4 million CFG tokens on Tin Lake wallet, which represent 1.4% of total supply. And part of these tokens, not all of them, definitely, this is just unclaimed rewards that mm, just stuck it in this wallet. So uh, our discussion is turning around transfer these tokens to centrifuge treasury and it would be great to hear any opinion about this. These tokens can be used for any purpose and centrifuge token holders will decide how to spend these tokens. Um, I've got a question. Do we, do yeah. we know how many token holders there are or, or perceived to be of uh, the, the 10 light tokens? Uh, if we are talking about the claimants that cannot be claimed or will be not never we claim it, we don't know. And But just I think two years ago, where half of million of tokens around that were unclaimed because some of investors just forget to link their wallets or just, I don't know, for any reason. Uh, if, has there been has there been any legal consideration of of this move? I mean, centrifuge DAO can decide, and but we can always get an opinion from our legal. I would I would just say the liability of uh, potential debtors in the future, it would be worth at least having that consideration. I don't know. That's a, yeah, uh, a good point. That's why it's just in a discussion phase. It hasn't been a formal proposal yet, so we can get these things clarified already now. So we need to be yeah, be sure that we do things the right way, but they are tokens that have been in the rewards wallet for a long time and haven't been claimed. So yeah, it's just about uh, what to do with them. Because the tokens, they will, they... Also, they were also minted, so this token already exists. So I'm just, I I do think there should be an incentive for, for participation, and maybe a negative incentive for a lack of participation, for sure. Well, this should be decided by centrifuge DAO, but for example, we can use this part of this token for a incentive for centrifuge pools. And uh, for, for rewards on centrifuge pools that could be launched, we already said that the 
rewards set to 1%. So instead of minting uh, additional tokens, we can just use these tokens instead of diluting our total supply. Yeah. Does, uh, does anyone think like this is a, a bad idea? I mean, like that this is not a good idea to do it. Like, feel free to um, provide input. We would love to hear. And likewise, since people think it's a good idea as well, I'd like to hear both. I mean, I think it's a good idea. It's just a matter of streamlining the right tracks for what centrifuge needs. Um, you know, especially if we're going to implement something similar to what Moonbeam's doing, because that I think the phrase some of the concern that like Seppi had earlier, you know, if they have some kind of setup where there is a delegated kind of council that can still weigh in. I mean, obviously we do a lot of, there's a lot of dialogue that happens in the centrifuge DAO Slack. So, you know, I think that conversation is good. We do a lot of stuff. Like the things I love about what the centrifuge team does is just even putting stuff out there for the discussion first, just kind of getting the the snapshot vote to get an, a gauge and understanding of like what people are looking for. Um, I, I'm not too particularly concerned. I don't see the drama on like what's happening in Polkadot on OpenGov. I don't really see that happening on individual parachains. So I don't think it's going to impact centrifuge and it does ostensibly help us decentralize further and just have a, a more robust governance setup. Um, but I think the people who are clearly committed to the chain and its well-being are going to be good stewards of whatever we enact moving forward. At least that's just my personal take. Yeah, I agree. For, for the thin lake, for the thin lake rewards, I mean, in your, uh, um, I have some ideas in the forum, but uh, I think, yeah, I agree that uh, we should give a timeline to the investors. I mean, like six months or one year or something. And later on, use the tokens as fit in the treasury or some kind of, you know, cutting the inflation for, for X amount of time, you know, giving rewards or pay the collators or something. <clears throat> meaningful yeah. but even nothing the in the treasury only it's it's like maybe the best uh, move yeah that's up to us to decide yet i mean there has nothing has been decided or even proposed yet this is just to start the discussion and then we'll see where it takes us nemo you had the your hand up yeah i'd echo what the others are saying kind of so it's like a, a way in the pros and cons, right? So if they're just left in the pool, they're not doing anything, they might never be claimed, right? Those accounts might be inactive. Whereas if it goes into the treasury, then it can be used to, uh, you know, progress uh, the centrifuge down further. Um, I would definitely say, uh, like the other guys were saying, some kind of timeline, like a lot of announcements on socials and stuff like, hey, you've got like one year or whatever to, to claim your rewards, otherwise they're going to go to the treasury. Um, but overall, I think moving it to the Treasury is probably the best move. Um, but like I think it was Jonathan said, um, we you'd need to make sure it was fine legally. I, I'm not sure about those implications. Yeah, that would uh, be great to get some clarity around that. But I think I read that not too long ago that there was... Um, I'm not sure if it was Arbitrum. Well, don't hang me up on it. But there was uh, like a project that transferred like unclaimed the uh, airdrop tokens to the treasury as well where the DAO voted on doing that so there has been precedent for this uh, earlier but yeah we absolutely need to make sure that we are not we are doing things the right way obviously but yeah instead of them just sitting idle there in the wallet then yeah they could go to the treasury and fund interesting things as Seppi suggested some really good things on the forum as well and uh, yeah that's uh, that's what we need to figure out uh, going forward. Are there any other uh, thoughts on this? What to do with unclaimed rewards? Anyone has an opinion on this? Some good ideas? All right. Well, um, Iman, did you post the link to the to the forum discussion so people can find it and 
they can join the discussion there. Yeah, thank you. The link is in the, the chat. So if you want to contribute, come with some good ideas to what can be done, then please do go and uh, yeah engage in that post. All right. That's actually all we had on the uh, on the agenda for today. So we covered everything that we wanted. Is there, uh, are there any general questions about governance that, uh, or something anyone else want to bring up and talk about? Um, Orhan, I, I just wanted to mention the, um, uh, the call, for the Arbitrum launch. I think the product used for the call was fantastic. The proprietary platform for the video call was fantastic. And I would highly encourage continual use of that platform. I think it looked, I think the entire presentation was fantastic. Great to hear. You mean for like uh, presentations like that, not for our governance call, right? Yes, sir. Got it. Yeah, we'll forward that feedback or the relevant people can watch the replay of this governance call and they'll get it. So thank you for that, Jonathan. Is there anything uh, else? Anybody else? Feel free. It's an open forum. We welcome everybody's voice. Not much, guys. <laughs> Be more active on Twitter, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah then the RWA narrative is pretty strong. I mean, I would like to see the core team and the, the, the guys in the community promote more the, the, the DAO. We can, um, I think that's a good idea. Let's start with that. You start it, I will retweet you. So uh, <laughs> go ahead and start. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So that I mean the narrative is uh, is strong right now and everybody is talking about it and especially now when market conditions are good the hype is even bigger right now so yeah but uh, we just do what we do best build yeah. keep building yeah, yeah. and let's just deliver a good product and everything else is going to come but yeah really good idea let's be more active on uh, on Twitter I'll yeah, see yeah. Recipe if you support me so let's do that all right anything else i feel like i've asked that three four times now i feel like i'm repeating myself but uh anything else all right well if there is nothing else then uh, there is no need to keep you guys hanging here for uh for much longer so um thank you all for joining the call, greatly appreciated all the input and all your opinions. So um, see you guys next month, same place, almost same time. Well, same same time actually. Take care, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.